would like to get started with this session. So welcome to this session which is, uh, it seems to be a very promising session, very exciting. I mean, when you talk about global health, partnerships are key. They are important. And more often than not, so far, we've been seeing partnerships between institutions that are located in high-income countries and those that are in low and middle-income countries. If you've been part of those partnerships at all, you recognize that sometimes they are quite challenging. It is real imbalance in power, in resources, uh, in the capacity that exists between those institutions. And because of those differences, there can be, at times, very challenging ethical issues or concerns. So that's what we are focusing on in this session for the next one and a half hours. We had planned to have five speakers, but we have three. One of them injured his back just as he was about to leave for this meeting, and so he canceled his travel. And the second one was given a big assignment by his bosses at the university. So last minute, he had to cancel. But despite that, we have got three very distinguished panelists who I'm sure will keep us engaged for uh, a good portion of the one and a half hours. And of course, the rest of the time, we want to hear from you, your experiences, the challenges you have made, and suggestions for how we can improve. Because if global health initiatives have to grow from strength to strength, we must find solutions for the challenges that we meet. And those solutions are going to come from you, not only the panelists. To get us started, on the extreme left is Professor Olapade Bumi. I call him Bumi in short because the other name is a little complicated to pronounce. <laughs> He's the provost of the College of Medicine at Ibadan University, but he's also the Executive Secretary of the uh, African Medical Schools Association, and also he's a professor of surgery, to be very specific, a professor of neurosurgery. So, Bumi, if you can get us started. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Nelson. Uh, and, uh, I thought he was calling us out for a boxing match, actually. You know, the far corner is, uh, <laughs> and then on the near corner is. Right, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, and uh, I must thank the organizers of the CUGH, uh, particularly Nelson, for inviting me to share some of my thoughts with you on this rather challenging topic. Uh, Nelson has actually laid out the uh, template as regards what we need to talk about. And if you look at your programs, you'll see that the title I was given was uh, that uh, lower middle income countries or educational institutions have experienced the good and the bad. But I don't know if you know that Clint Eastwood film. I thought it would be nice to just simply make it all three, you know, have a full whammy, so I put the ugly in myself. So that's not in your, uh, uh, in the, uh, what are the remit, but I thought to make it complete, we should look at it that way. So I bring you greetings from my city, which is uh, both ancient and modern. Uh, we have an old city, but we also have a very modern college of medicine, which is where I currently practice. My disclosure is simply that I'm an independent director of uh, health management organization, and this is my lecture outline. Okay, uh, as Nelson said, I'm representing or coming from both the University of Badan from the Association of Medical Schools of Africa, which, as you will soon find out, uh, is one of the good things that came out of the partnership with high-income uh, 
countries. But there are some definitions so that we're all on the same page. Uh, what's the partnership? What's ethical? What's effective? The one I'd like to focus on most is an educational institution. Most people forget that tertiary institutions exist for one purpose and one purpose in only. To generate the knowledge that is required to drive the economy of the community in which they're situated. That is the function of an educational institution. We do teach students, but that's a byproduct. The real function of an educational institution is to generate the knowledge that drives that local economy. And therefore, production of graduates is not as important as production of fit for purpose graduates. So the graduates that are fit for purpose in one country certainly will be different from those from another country. And then some service. We all know what a network is. And for the purposes of this discussion, I've lumped institutions and networks together as educational systems. I've taken the World Bank classification of lower middle income countries and of high income countries. What's an ideal partnership? Well, again, just to make sure we're all on the same page, it engenders joint ownership. We must really feel we're both in it. Uh, there must be equity and equality. It's two different things. Equity suggests that we have equal representation. Equality suggests that we both have an opportunity to be at the table. It's two different things. Uh, espouses mutual respect, addresses the needs of each partner, and it maximizes the strength and minimizes the weakness of each of those partners. Most importantly, it fosters interdependence and gives each party a sense of self-worth. Therefore, it must result in growth and sustainable development. A mutually benefiting partnership, therefore, must have as a strong component bi-directional learning. I trained in the UK and in the US, I am those who have a keen eye would notice that I spelled maximizes in the English way and minimizes in the American way just to make sure that nobody got upset. <laughs> but seriously speaking, uh, when I go back home, I had as much to learn from them as I had learned, they could learn from what I had been taught abroad. Therefore, it's a symbiotic relationship, and there must be synergism. Synergism means that the sum total of the actions from the two parties is much more than the simple addition of their strengths. So if you're going to play as a team and one plus one is equals to two, you're going to be beaten by a team where one plus one is equals to three. That's synergism. So that's what a partnership tries to get in place. But which lower middle income country are we talking about? Because it's usual for you to, people to lump all lower middle income countries together, just like Africa. You know, people say to me, where are you from? I say, Nigeria. I say, yes, I have a friend from Ethiopia. Good God, that's seven hours by flight. <laughs> you know, so it's not all the same. Which lower middle income country are you talking about? Well, there is Nigeria, where, and I'll only focus on two things, the black lines, the number of educational institutions is going up, just like in Indonesia, another low, lower middle income country, it's going up. But look at their poverty indices. In Indonesia, it's dropping. In Nigeria, it's going up. We suggest that Indonesia's institutions are creating jobs, whilst those in Nigeria are creating poverty. That's what this, the maps say. I don't say so. Yeah. World Bank, don't blame me, and I'm Nigerian. <laughs> Where does it all end up? Well, look at their relative competitiveness on the global indices in health and primary education, uh, education, higher education. But the one that really gets me is innovation. Lower middle income countries that we're talking about here are not innovating. We need to find out why. Because to develop, you must innovate. You must be creative. Of course, overall, you can see what happens. So this I just got from the internet. You have on the left side, well, your left side, Washington, D.C. And on the right side, Ibadan, my city. And you can see the relative orderliness of Washington, D.C. and the sort of mixed match that you get in a real lower middle income country. Mixture of high rise building with huts. Well, not real huts, but they're near huts. And general disorganization. So there's growth in the midst of chaos. You do not have the organized society of a high middle income country. But this is the one I like best. This is the world at night, hasn't changed much. And this is the lower middle income country we're talking about. There's no light. 
You know, when I listen to people talking to me about telemedicine, you need light for telemedicine. There's no light. And most of Africa is dark at night. There's a little light here. It's not electricity, it's glass flaring, you know, from the petroleum in industry. So this is what we're talking about. There's a little light in South Africa, you know, and a little light in Northern Africa, but most of Africa is dark. And if you think it's a joke, look at the internet traffic. It mirrors it. So how exactly do you have a partnership between this heavy load of internet traffic here and this void here? Partnership. Somebody changed the definition recently? So we're talking here about high-income countries and low, lower middle-income countries with these characteristics. Again, I wish that you focus really on the fact that there are strong systems here and weak systems here. Stable populations, indeed decreasing populations, now we have that on you. Expanding populations, and most important is near certain future versus uncertain future. You, you really cannot project for a long time in a lower middle income country. You literally live from, not really day to day, but sometimes it's a bit like that. I mean, sometimes you feel the way you, America felt a couple of days ago, you slept, you woke up and Syria had been bombed. Aha. That sort of thing changes the situation dramatically. And all of a sudden, all things have a different look. And that is what we face on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're really looking at partnerships between institutions. And was it that there was a sunset at dawn? Was it at the very beginning this was not going to work? If you look at the historical perspective, you see that most educational institutions were set up by the high-income countries during the colonial times in lower middle-income countries. They taught three of the four hours, reading, writing, and arithmetic. And most of the institu tertiary institutions started off as colleges of parent universities in the uh, colonial countries and later became full-fledged universities. But the character of the partnerships has not changed. Curricular and administrative processes were generally imported from the parenting institutions. They were maintained by grants. And that support has continued to today. But if you look at the experience of the lower middle income countries generally, now to what I was asked to do, if you look at the good, what good has come out? There has been a continued grant support for most of the educational systems from lower middle income countries. I can tell you that it's roughly about 80% of research done across Africa is funded externally, about 80%. And there's also a lot of capacity building. People like me come across and go back. Some are trained in situ. And there's a lot of exchange to strengthen the institutions. There's a development of networks. We're here. This is one of it, the CUGH. Strong networks. And a lot of times the system is being sustained. Therefore, many research units have developed. And many experts have been made. You can count, at least in my institution, we have several world leaders across the the departments. So there has been a growth of the institutions, uh, the networks, and of course the economies of the countries. This has encouraged North, South, South, South collaborations. And Joe Colas, who is in the audience, and I wrote a paper on MEPI's uh, uh, ability to encourage such collaborations. They've also established communities of practice, various stakeholders. And all this has been good for lower middle income countries. There have been several medical education projects in sub-Saharan Africa in particular. There was the SAM study, uh, there was the African Medical Education Summit, then there was a consortium of African medical schools, and more recently the MEPI and NEPI projects, many, many others. All these have benefited lower middle income countries, and these are just for sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, technical failure here. Uh, hello. Next slide, please. Thank you. If you continue, what have been the benefits of these projects? Well, we have a much better understanding of what medical education in particular is in sub-Saharan Africa. There has been a lot of capacity building in research and in medical education in general. As I said, a community of practice has been created, and there is an improved culture of collaboration with all stakeholders, universities, ministries, Everybody comes to the table now. There was a nice session about that uh, earlier on today. 
And therefore, uh, with the increasing partnerships, uh, particularly with MEPI and NEPI, there was a request, uh, there was a, a, an attempt to ensure that the lower middle income countries actually participated more in the decision making process. This has led to the advancement of performance metrics, and there has been the establishment or revitalization of health education networks. The Association of Medical Schools for Africa had been hibernating for quite a while. We woke up during the SAM study and has been running since. And more recently, the Afri Health has been uh, created from uh, MEPI. AMSA, in particular, was founded in 1963 by a partnership between the Rockefeller Foundation, the Association of uh, American Medical Colleges, and five medical schools, including mine, in sub Saharan Africa. It provided a forum for networking within. Uh, Africa and with uh, the WAMC, it formed as a, a platform on which the uh, African medical schools could also partner with other institutions, other organizations and networks that were involved in medical education. I really did a lot of work before it went into hibernation in the 1980s and was woken up again in 2014. Since then, it's been trying to get its act back together, published two major papers to direct uh, medical education in sub-Saharan Africa, and now we're planning a uh, conference for later on this year. What about the bad? Well, most of the programs that lower middle income countries run are designed in the north, like I said, where there's a lot of light. And it's directed from the north. It's taken a while, but that has a major problem. And most of them are therefore not directed at the needs of the lower middle income countries. We've recently reworked our curriculum medical uh, curriculum to address this particular purpose. There is also limited provision or support for infrastructure in lower middle income countries with all the grant support. It's usually directed specifically at the needs of that research project and not of the institution, never mind the economy. And this therefore means that as many projects as come into sub-Saharan Africa in particular, there is limited imprint in the community or in the community or indeed in the institution. It's just on that project. Inadvertently, most of the experts and researchers in sub-Saharan Africa or lower middle income countries now focus on NIH grants, other external grants. There's little desire to have community-derived or community-driven projects that would ensure we understand the needs of the society and therefore improve on it, even with foreign participation. No, they're rather interested in the genetics of selenium digestion by the third toe in fifth rat, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and therefore, you find out that most of the lower middle income country uh, institutions are inadvertently dependent on the high income countries, which makes you wonder about independence. Inevitably, it encourages brain drain, and whichever brain is not drained that is invited takes flight, he gets on the flight himself and gets out. You know, so that's part of the bad. But the real ugly part of it is that the educational systems of lower middle income countries are now really external grant dependent. In my country, it's about 85%. They therefore focus on internationally designed projects. Uh, there are really very little projects that are designed at home. And therefore, the institutions have not uh, developed a culture of innovation. They really lack the desire to develop an ability to solve local problems because it's not profitable for them. It's much more profitable to collaborate with the North and get things done, get their papers in the Lancet, get their papers in high-impact high journals instead of at home where nobody cares. I mean, nobody seems to care. We therefore have strong individuals, not strong institutions or systems. That is why the poverty index is rising because we are not really contributing to developing the country or the economy. Most of the policies generated from these research institutions, uh, research projects, and we heard uh, earlier on today that it takes about 14 years for, in America for 30% of uh, research projects to eventually become policies in Africa is near zero because the research projects were never designed to solve African problems. They may be designed to find out what the, collabor uh, what the corroboration of problems in the North and the South are, but they're hardly designed to solve the problem in those, country, uh, those communities where the collaboration takes place. Therefore, there is no strategy, no direction, and the projects are unsustained. You therefore have this unenviable situation where you have growth 
without development. That inevitably means that the brains that are left in lower middle income countries that have not drained or have not taken flight are fighting so hard, they're soon in the drain themselves. And at the end of the day, they don't make the sort of impact that you would like. So in reality, <laughs> are lower middle income countries truly able to partner with high income countries? Well, the answer is yes. Because these partnerships have been going on from the beginning, they're still going on now and will probably continue to go on. Lower middle income educational systems were built and, and continue to be supported by high income countries, so that is some sort of partnership. There has been mutually beneficial associations, as I have shown, and there has been more good than bad, but definitely things could be better. We therefore need those partnerships to be redirected in order that the development and the good they do be sustained. Otherwise, it will all come to naught. So we're hoping that this is a sunrise of ethical and effective partnerships in education. And that picture I took, the San Diego uh, sunrise, was really very nice. And we hope this is a sunrise where there will be considerations for ethics and effectiveness in partnerships between high and uh, lower middle income countries. And going forwards, and this is my second to the last slide, what do we do? I'm hoping that that is what we're going to discuss here. But to, to really get ahead, we must overhaul the lower middle, uh, lower middle income educational systems and include the fourth R that has been left out of the four R's of basic education. These are true partners. Thank you very much. said all these studies have been done, yet we're still having a high proportion of women who have HIV giving birth and breastfeeding babies. That's a lack of an infant. And yet the why is the research was not done in a way that would enable it to penetrate the community. If you, if you, you, you spoke about hand washing and uh, diarrheal diseases. Okay, so I'll give you an example. So we had Ebola in Nigeria, and in two weeks, everybody had a hand sanitizer. There were bowls of water everywhere. If you had done a study in some institution with $20 million, published it in The Lancet, and went away and gave it to the Ministry of Health, there would be no impact. That is the difference between doing research project that directly addresses a problem in the community. You don't need research to tell you to wash your hands, to stop diarrhea. You need to educate people. So that's what it's about. Even the PMCT problem is the same thing. Have you actually penetrated the people? When I got back from the United States, I went with my fancy endoscopic equipment and my fancy stuff. It was all broken in six months until I got people to realize that their destiny was tied to the equipment. Now I'm here, everybody's looking after it. So it's not about successful research. What is successful research? It's about impact. Okay. Yeah, hi, uh, Quentin Ashman. Ben. Let's keep the questions brief and the responses Sorry. will be brief. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's more of the response. Um, so I, I would contest that there's a lack of innovation in Africa. I think if you speak to innovate, innovators in the US, the biggest problem isn't innovation, it's development of the innovation. And so I'm intrigued about how you scale up the innovation, and I'm always intrigued by Nigel Crisp's statement in his book, Turning the World Upside Down, where he says, I send my residents to Africa in order to come back and tell me how to run the NHS more efficiently. The thing there is the innovation's happening, and the development can happen more easily back in the UK. So I think it's a development problem and possibly an implementation problem as well. And I'm curious how you would see it from that point of view, because I think there's enormous resourcefulness in Africa, really. Thank you. Um, I think the difference between innovation, as I've classified it, is uh, really in this slide, where uh, I said what, what happens in low middle income countries is that they're constantly adapting. They adapt to the situation. Innovation is when you do something that's creative and like you said, you get to sell it outside. 
the things we do are not necessarily considered advanced. We adapt to a situation. I, I, I spent a long time training in here, but I tell you, when you want to operate in Africa, it's a, if you're not innovative, then all your patients will die. But nobody's going to allow you to sell that. You can't even write it in a book until you publish it. So we're classifying innovation as is understood in the West. That is not to say we're not adapting. And I do agree with you that a lot of the things we do would be of great interest to the West if the West were interested. Catherine Egbe from UCSF, and um, my question is in relation to um, policy or research-driven policy in low- and middle-income countries, because most of the time we have governments who do not use research to, to, to make decisions, unlike what you have in high-income countries. If the FDA wants to make a policy, they would give grants to people to do research and give them information that they need to drive that policy. But we don't have that in low and middle income countries. So what's your take about government buy-in um, into research and, and, the, and the products of research in terms of driving their policies? That's a good question. Um, simply put, it's too expensive to do research that others have done uh, and would not encourage to be done. One of the areas we have issues with pharma um, in low and middle income countries is trying to get them to do it, repeat the research they've done to get the same FDA approval before they can even sell the drugs in low and middle income countries. There was a particular antihypertensive that was a hypertensive in Nigeria. It was only after he had killed like a hundred people that everybody woke up. But the truth of the matter is that pharma won't do it. Why? Because the government would say, why do you want to do so? Just give us the money. So that's why you would not get, there, there is no value put on local research generally. And until that happens again from bottom up, that's what's going to happen. So that's why it wouldn't form health policy unless there is a catastrophe. And I go back to the Rhoda situation. So once the projects are community derived, then they will become health policy. And there are quite a few that do and work on that. I can assure you. Otherwise, we probably won't be here. Okay, let's take one more. Um, hi, my name is Rimel Mwamba, and I'm an undergrad student. Um, and my question lies within the framework of partnerships between um, lower and middle and um, high income countries. And so my curiosity is in the skepticism that I often hear about um, having these sorts of partnerships with the idea that, you know, African problems need African solutions, even though global health is very interconnected. And so with the history of colonialism and the, the history that um, the continent has experienced, is there ever a point, in your opinion, where the denial of foreign aid is necessary? So to like stop the dependency of African countries on international help? Good question. Um, I think we've gotten over the colonial issue. It's purely business. It's, it's just more convenient that way. Uh, and until it becomes more convenient for th things to be developed uh, in Africa, it will remain that way. It's, it's, not, it's not really a colonial mentality, trust me. Um, it, it, it's that there, there has to be an understanding that in truth, African problems need African solutions. But that's only one half of the story. The real story is that African solutions for African problems are applicable everywhere. That has to be understood. Until that is understood, you're not going to get anywhere. When we write papers and we send it out, I've sent a paper out before, molecular biology, and the simple one line, this study could not have been done in Africa. That was the rejection letter. It simply couldn't have been done. So it's, it's not a color. Oh, we've gotten past the colonial thing. It's nothing colonial. It's just, it's just business. So until we can find a way, and I think it's up to Africans, to be honest with you, find a way to make those solutions interesting to the other parts of the world and have the opportunity to market it, we will not get Africa over the, the issue of that. In my school, we did a, we did a, a curriculum revision uh, and produced the first competency-based medical education curriculum uh, in the world. 
everybody is using it. Malaysia, even the Royal College of uh, Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada sent us some congratulations. Etc. Everybody took it. Now they've modified it, and everybody is running from it. It's all about acceptability. Once it's acceptable, then there's no problem. Thank you very much, Bumi. Uh, Let's go to the next speaker. We switch gears and go to North America. Professor Majid Sadi is an infectious disease specialist. He's an associate professor and director of uh, Global Health University of Vermont. He has had several or many collaborations in Africa, in Russia, and so on. He's a holder of the Christian J. Trez family endowed chair in Global Health at the Western Connecticut Health Network. He's very actively engaged in global health educational activities uh, on at least three continents. Who would be more suited to talk about issues in global health than a person who holds an endowed chair in global health? Most welcome. Sorry, may I have uh, my slides on? First, I need really to apologize because listening to the first speaker and listening to your questions, I shall confess that I do not have really any granular messages for you. And also, I would say that I am purely educator. I am infectious disease especially, obviously, but my engagement in global health over the last 21, 22 years have been mainly as an educator. And probably in my story and my talk this afternoon, you may discover element of love story, but all of you who are mentors, you know the love story between the mentors and mentees. Let me start by saying that forming and sustaining equitable partnership with international colleagues is a challenging task. It requires passion, leadership, transparency, cultural sensitivity, friendship, and endurance. All the time and effort spent is an investment towards something valuable and mistakes, miscommunications are unavoidable. Pain is an inherent part of any growth process. We have to accept that. Western Connecticut Health Net Global Health Program, obviously I would say probably originate from much older partnership with basically Yale a School of Medicine, but most global health partnership of the Department of Medicine. It is a part of much bigger partnership in medical education between the University of Vermont Robert Lerner College of Medicine and Western Connecticut Health Network. University of Vermont campus is located in Burlington in Vermont, very close to Canada. But Western Connecticut Health Net is in Connecticut, in part of the western part of Connecticut, and consists of three major hospitals, Danbury, New Milford, and Norwalk. And it is a distant campus for University of Vermont, Lerner College of Medicine, and the headquarter of the Global Health Program. What we in 
this program, we would like to gain from a global health partnership. What we gain from Global Health Partnership is clear. A reminder to our medical students, residents, and faculty that empathy has called us to medicine. We want to connect with patients, families from diverse backgrounds. We care about human stories. We are patient advocates and have been licensed to serve. We want to teach them that we are all connected genetically across all boundaries, political or otherwise. We want to teach them to celebrate diversity and eliminate boundaries. But it is not our place to define the wants of our international partners. Instead, we must understand their wants through transparent communication. We can make known our resources and leave it to them to choose how to use the resources to potential they envision. It is our responsibility in Global North to share our abundance of resources to work fair, equal, for all, doesn't matter that all is inside the United States or outside. I'm sorry, I'm okay. At the heart of any true collaboration is preservation of the dignity of the host institutions. We only do harm by trying to teach locals how to do things the right way or my way. We cannot know what the right way is for them. The right way is often bound up in cultural, political, economic issues that are unique to that setting. We can only understand the issues by power of observation and by asking questions to learn. This is about them. This is about them and only then can it be about us. Partnership in global health is not a business model, but it is a love story. Collaboration grows around a beautiful unified humanitarian concept Although the memorandum of understandings establishes the rules of the road, they are not sufficient in securing sustainability. With time, the relationship evolves into a true friendship that binds partners together in ways that transcends business. This allows for a deeper understanding of each side's needs and barriers, promoting cultural understanding and integration. When friendship binds the player, creative solution all the time can be found to sustain the program and support friends through difficult times. There are the principles, and these are the real principles that I suggest we should follow whenever we are. The Global Health Program at Western Connecticut Health Net, University of Vermont, is longitudinal. We carefully select our student early in their medical school career, match them with mentors, engage them in well-structured curriculum to orient them to our global health challenges, including emotional, socio-cultural, and ethical dilemmas. We are 
also invite selected members of our partner institution to the United States where they join our global health family for three to 12 months of educational experiences directed to our capacity building for their own institution. This photo taken during pre-departure orientation weekend shows a group of medical students with our Ugandan and Vietnamese colleagues who comprise part of the faculty who prepare these medical students for the elective. More importantly, one of their responsibility upon return to their home countries is to supervise our medical students and residents. This demonstrates mutual benefit. We host them in order to improve medical education and patient care in their home country and to allow us to improve the medical education of our own elective participant through their role as faculty members. Let them be the seeds of the new changes. Toward this important concept, we together with Global Health Program of Yale Department of Medicine have brought more than 50 partner members over the last 21 years from Russia who have now become key leaders in their own medical education system. They not only support our participant, but have changed the landscape of medical education at Kazan Medical, Kazan State Medical University. I shall say that a recent study that we did, the people who really were brain drained were medical students when we brought them to United States. Any junior faculty that we brought to United States, even if they stay for long period of time, they return back home. That gave us this lesson that if we want to bring somebody for capacity building, we have to bring somebody who is more senior, has roots in her, his or her own country, and is basically royal to the university and to his homeland. This program, again together with Yale Department of Medicine Global Health Program, has accomplished similar goals in Uganda. Over 40 junior faculty from McElroy University College of Health Sciences have come to United States where we maintain a strong infrastructure for, for uh, hosting them. Here in this picture, Dr. Charles Musake, a global health sco scholar from Uganda at the center of this photograph is surrounded by members of global health program team who are involved in supporting our colleagues from international sites. We bring them into our families and homes. We show them the challenges of medical education, medical system in the United States, a, true, a truly bi-directional global health program invest as much energy on their own people as they do on those they host. Meanwhile, Global Health Program sends faculty members from the United States to these communities for different projects, such as coordination of a course or development of new protocols. Alongside local colleagues, they brainstorm, come to new ideas, and share knowledge and experience. Meanwhile, so this is in 2016, residents and students from the United States spend a total of 243 weeks as partner sites. Meanwhile, global health leaders and fellows from around the world have spent 244 weeks on visits and global health rotations in the United States. goal of research. We understood very early that when you are doing elegant, elegant research, there are population of patients that they are dying under your eyes. So, what I or we basically suggest 
suggests the impact of the research is compounded by service and training. Our research endeavors should be centers on how to better serve patients and communities. I'm not a researcher, we have not done yet really any much of the big major research, but this is all that, you know, a couple of really example that I'm going to show you. When we learn that a Uganda hospital with high seroprevalence of HIV among patients didn't have a protocol for post-exposure prophylaxis, we help the hospital and clinics establish a protocol and educate the healthcare workers. We send solar lights to another community that was electricity scarce to study the impact of light in education of school children. Informal caregivers in Mulago Hospital, Uganda, form the backbone of patient care because there is one nurse probably per 70, 100 patients. These patient family members live on the grounds of this vastly understaffed hospital to tend to patient needs. We study the economic and social impact of the role of the informal caregiver and advocated for these true patient advocates by bringing their needs to the attention of the hospital administration. These caregivers also taught us valuable lessons through their selfless commitment to supporting one another and the strength and resiliency created through the power of community that we hope to implement in our own environment in the US. While they lack certain practical resources, they are rich in other resources that we lack. To meaningfully advocate for anyone, one must approach the cause free of assumption and bias. One must simply ask from a place of candor what the needs might be. They have something to teach you and you have things to learn from them. This truth lies at the heart of the global health. An act with intention and understanding. An international collaboration is akin to a marriage between a plant and a human. With similarities and dissimilarities, if you are patient, committed, focused on the mission selfishly, the partnership is try like Lobelia that blooms after 14 to 16 years at 3,500 meter elevations of volcano mountains, Kilimanjaro or Mount, Mount Kenya, where the air is thin and the living conditions unfavorable. A global health program is essentially a bridge connecting two islands to allow an equal exchange of complementary resources. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Majid. Again, let's take a few questions for clarification or otherwise before we go to the next speaker. Thank you for that passionate, eloquent, beautiful description of global health partnerships as you see them. We also heard 
a great critique of some of the ethical complications of global health and partnerships as others see them. You know, we're in a really new and different political climate now with all kinds of ramifications for where we can go with global health as academics or policy people. And what I would welcome at this time, this is actually not who I am, but this is what I want, is language of real politic. Something that will put in very concrete, self-serving terms why global health partnerships are necessary for the future of the planet and this country, and what it is that is non-negotiable, what an accountable partnership looks like with clear, attainable objectives, with reasonable resources provided by both all members of partnerships. I, I just think that in this day, idealism, romanticism, Christian values or whatever it is that makes young people want to volunteer so in such numbers, these are not what's going to get us where we need to go. Can you help us with some other language about why this is an essential enterprise for all of us and needs support? And, and I address that to all of you. Do you want to? Um, there is no only question in my mind that there has been no time in the history of the past probably hundred years of political landscape of the United States that there has been so much need for global health. I think really we are privileged because we have phenomenal number of the faculty, residents, medical students that they are passionate, they come to medicine for empathy and we have to nurture them. There are many of us be born to be the citizen of the world. Our obligation as mentors and educators is basically discovering these beautiful humans and nurture them. I think really that's the only way that we can succeed. Just in academia, we need really to come together. We need to organize ourselves and we should be a unified voice to protect really the values that we value. Such beautiful so. sentiments, but I don't think beautiful people is gonna get us there right now. That's the trouble, that's what I'm worried about. I agree let's, and, and- Let's yeah. keep that response okay. until later after <laughs> she has made her presentation. Very brief comments, please. And then we'll go to you. Yeah, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Very that's what human beings should be. Uh, between 2000 and 2015, uh, the uh, Millennium Development Goals number eight was based on global partnership. I'm not sure if really we did do very well in the last 15 years. And here we are today, the top leaders are all saying that we have global partnership. Now we are saying in the uh, for global health. Now, what have failed to each time I hear this partnership between high and low in uh, middle income countries, the focus of north and south, sometimes I ask myself, across the north, aren't there low and mid middle income countries? Now, has somebody come up on the to study and see which partnerships works much much easier? Is it across north? North, if there are high versus low and middle income countries, versus high in the north versus south. I don't know what can we do. I tried to do um, basically um, bring a new concept that global health is a bridge between two islands, that each of these yeah. islands is very resourceful. I envy whenever I go to Uganda and I see really a husband of a woman who is paralyzed from one of the medications.
condition that we live for HIV because has mitochondria disease. And the husband has completely closed the door of the shop, moved to Mulago, and to kill his wife. And I remember this gentleman had basically stool stained up to the arm. And I said, don't you have any child? Don't you have any daughter? And he said, listen, this is my responsibility. I have seen such beautiful smiles on the face of the people in Uganda, in East Timor, in Botswana, in Zimbabwe, in Zambia, that I wish I could transplant that to the face of my son or my daughter or my wife or so many others. But so many things that we do not have. That is shameful to think that is the law versus the law. It's equal but in different manner and obviously supplementary and complementary to each other. So that's the vision that I believe is going to work and I believe, you know, entirely that that's the true and real thing. Brief. <laughs> we still have one speaker to go and discuss. My question is about uh, partnerships and memorandums of understandings, the ethical bit of it. Uh, you realize that back home in my country, we have various memorandums of understandings with various universities in the United States. But then what's surprising is that much as you bring your people from the universities from the states, bring in very many students, very few of our students come this way to perhaps have a bit of the medical system this side. And I'm wondering, is it, or I, I would think that a partnership would be beneficial to both parties, but I'm looking at this partnership being a one-way thing that you guys are benefiting from us, and back home, people are not really benefiting from us, from you people. Let's take the other two as well. Ijeoma Northern Wayne State University, MedPeds. Uh, real quickly, thank you again for an excellent presentation. Truly, it was beautiful, poetic even. Uh, and sort of piggybacking on uh, my colleague who asked um, earlier, um, you spoke about cultural humility, essentially, in summary. Cultural humility, you know, and, and understanding that the host um, societies have something to teach us and or to teach the high HMICs coming in, etc. It's it's a it's bidirectional. Um, the thing is that this concept has been spoken about multiple times. This is not a new concept of cultural competence and humility, etc. And yet we still see these problems today. Uh, the problems we're talking about of um, where those issues are not are not practiced, in other words. So the practice is not keeping up with the theory and with the with the rhetoric, so to speak. And I just want to submit that one possibility one possibility in terms of a reason for this, could it be that we as global health professionals haven't addressed our own implicit biases? Um, and that this may be constituting a, a barrier in effectively tr uh, transforming or, or translating rather the theory of cultural humility to actual practical cultural humi humility practices. And I'll be curious to know what your thoughts are in terms of, again, global health professional implicit biases that may be uh, manifested um, in terms of practice. And the last one. Um, those are both very loaded questions. So I think I'll, I'll go ahead and just wait for the panel discussion to sit in my <laughs> Senior Program Officer uh, at the Africa Center for Communication and Programs, Johns Hopkins University, and also uh, at the University of uh, North Carolina. She directed the USID's flagship uh, Global Health Fellowship Program, and she focuses on helping to build the next generation of diverse, 
collective global health professionals. So I am grateful to you who stayed. Thank you for that. And I, I just want to mention that in the course of my conversation, I've embedded the secret to a happy life. So just so you know, uh, I'll talk for less than 10 minutes, and I only have seven slides. Uh, these large institutional partnerships are based on individual relationships, and that's what I want to focus on. These lessons are simple, and they're obvious. And I agree with those who are in the audience who have mentioned that there is a wonderment about why we fail so often to, to practice the behaviors that we're describing now. Um, but the forces in the business of international development can create obstacles to being our best selves, to, being, to, un to uncovering our unconscious biases when we do this work. I, I've learned a lot of these lessons from my fellows, Global Health Fellows Program fellows, but mostly from health professionals that I've worked with in countries such as Ghana, Kenya, Tanzania, Ethiopia, Zambia, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Afghanistan, Nepal, Yemen, Indonesia, and Thailand. So as you can see, I've had a lot of opportunity to really make a lot of mistakes. I'm pitching these lessons mostly to um, high-income country representatives that are here. But I think there's something in this for all of us. Um, when you work as a technical advisor or in a partnership, your two immediate overriding objectives should be to establish trust and to demonstrate that you can add value. But that is actually a little bit tricky. So lesson number one, seek first to understand by practice active listening. Their country interests override anything else. So try to identify what those interests are. Don't be afraid to show initiative in learning the full truth. There are some bad habits in our industry. There can be this mutual collusion about not, not facing the complex truths. Initially, in-country professionals may only be telling you what they know you want to hear. This is especially true in countries with a colonial history or significant conflict. And we have fostered that collusion, especially when we secretly feel the challenges are overwhelming. Lesson number two, practice humility, as we've heard before. A lack of humility destroys trust, so don't assume you know more than your host counterpart. You will never know all the answers, so it's an attitude of empathetic awareness and the learner's heart that allows mistakes to be forgiven. It's not about you proving yourself or demonstrating your value with a barrage of data and other country stories. And thank you for those who are shaking their heads yes. Don't try to establish the relationship by showing off your expertise and your knowledge, especially by going quickly to the solution. This not listening is such a common mistake. It's fueled by the eagerness of an early career professional and also that been there, done that senior professional, that ennui that we can experience. They're both mistakes. It results in a quiet sigh from your colleagues as you might not even notice as you hurry on to fix everything. You are not the first, shall I say, American who has come their way ready to fix things, and you probably won't be the last. Instead, find a way to balance the power and the privilege that is reflected in your being from a high-income country with access to American institutions and American resources. Balance that with that acute awareness and humility, that awake inner observer. Lesson number three, be their champion. Although complete country ownership rarely happens, it has to be an authentic high priority for us. 
This means you are coming into a relationship with a focus on a post-you environment. Decisions will stick only if LMIC professionals truly own them. The donor community doesn't help this relationship when it puts too many obstacles in the way of empowering in-country institutions. The DUNS numbers that are required, the complex bidding processes that are hard to figure out, the bias towards giving most of the money to American organizations, and the American university partners who don't help when they don't pay attention to authorship on publications. In communication about your work, promote the real picture of your host country. It usually differs from international media stories. Be generous about helping your local counterparts make connections with the international community. Share your professional network. Make available all your secret connections, your technical resources. This is a joint venture with peers. So start it with a sense of mutual respect and a culture of sharing. Also value local talent and make the best use of that to make your work more meaningful and sustainable. Lesson number four, respect the culture. Make efforts, of course, to understand local norms, cultures, and transitions. But seek to understand how people approach the key issues in their daily life. No culture is a monolithic construct, but rather an intricate web of narratives. It's the stories that matter. For example, in most cultures, family, the family importance really can't be overstated. So don't turn down the dinner in order to return to your hotel room to read your emails. How many people have ever done that? I know. It's those choices that we make. Another example, and this is what I'm very well aware of, is even though USAID, the United States Agency for International Development, is an American agency, and the Foreign Service nationals that serve in that agency have adapted to that reality, the most important things are happening outside the compound. Cultural competence is never a checklist, and admittedly, you can never really learn everything about a country but honest efforts will be noted and appreciated. Lesson number five. Oops, so sorry. Lesson number five. Solutions must be contextualized within existing systems and structures. Don't assume you have the answer, even if you easily see all the things that are wrong. This ability to see is part of the nature of being an outsider. Plus, the donor usually requires some kind of result in one to five years. Despite that, seek to cause change in slow, measured steps to avoid negative, unintended consequences. Don't offer solutions without understanding host country systems. Remember, not everything local needs to change. There are so many best practices. You know, as my colleague here said, so many lessons to bring home. So many needs in our own countries, but that's another session. There are best practices already in place in that host country. You know, I love a good radio soap opera with embedded health messages and a great cell phone app. But don't assume that modern technology is going to magically fix everything. Context and environment matter. I'm grateful to our partner universities for your patience with us as we come and go in your country and for your generosity of spirit and forgiveness, certainly, of my many mistakes over the years. I've learned a lot from you, and I continue to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that very clear presentation. Now, it's time for the complex questions. <laughs> uh, thank you all very much for those talks. That was, that was amazing. That was very incredible. 
uh, to hear all the stories and the lessons. Uh, my name is Mohan, you know, uh, sorry, my name is Mohan Sudbatula. I'm an undergrad from the University of Utah. And um, to preface my question, um, I recently started a nonprofit organization in October, and uh, that's why I'm here. But um, basically, what we're doing is we're looking at the abundance of resources within the United States and taking mislabeled medical waste, so uh, things after, you know, temporary use that are still viable to be used again, crutches, wheelchairs, orthotic braces, prosthetics, things like that, um, and cleaning them up, sending them to developing healthcare facilities abroad to be reused for patients in need um, who otherwise need them more. And so um, my question for all of you then is um, kind of with this, we've been very fortunate to be partnered with uh, two community partners within Hyderabad, India, and uh, they've been utilizing our services and are still using them, but we're looking to slowly expand our operations and being on the undergrad level, uh, I don't have a lot of access to starting relationships or penetrating new countries or other target communities. And so uh, my question for all of you then would be, what uh, tips or advice would you have for someone who otherwise would like to continue to facilitate these types of relationships and foster the existing ones that are already there? Okay, let's take a second one and a third one. Brad Dreyfus, University of Arizona. Uh, first of all, really want to thank all of you very much. This is a conversation that's needed to be had for a long time. Um, there's a great article, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with, NUR, I think it was 2015 or 2016, all about equitable partnerships that was put together by CSIS and COGH. It's fantastic. And I think one of the foci that really stood out for me that we need to focus on is monitoring and evaluation of the partnerships themselves. Not just the programs that come out of the partnerships, but the actual partnerships and figuring out how to do that well. That's, pardon me, thank you, heads up. Um, one of the big questions I've been struggling with, and I think most of us have, and there's a lot of angst about, are the funding mechanisms. We fund global health based on research questions siloed in their own individual entities, and rarely on more horizontal or diagonal based structures. Often, I hypothesize because it's based on grant cycles, which are short, and election terms, which are short. But the measurable impact that we're actually looking for happens over the span of potentially decades. It's that investment, it's the relationships, why most of us are involved in partnerships in the first place. How do we move forward to really start creating more alignment between the funding mechanisms that actually drive the work and creating more alignment between that and the outcomes that we say we want to actually achieve? Thank you. Thank you. Please keep it short. Okay. I don't necessarily have a question, but I just wanted to comment on an experience I had. Um, my name is Erica Sante. I'm the program manager at the Office of Global Health at UT Southwestern Medical Center in Dallas, Texas. So I've worked in a number of places with the World Bank and National Medical Corps and then with Pink Ribbon Red Ribbon, which uh, was initiated by President Bush. Uh, and I don't work there currently. But the best experience I had was, or the most interesting experience I had was when we were training, or not me rather, but a group of Zambian doctors and nurses came from Zambia to train doctors and nurses in Namibia uh, on BIA and cryotherapy and everything. And I found it to be so powerful because it was the first time for me, at least within my ca professional career, that I saw South and South relationship training. And I think sometimes even in, amongst, and I can speak to, to Africa, amongst Africans, we or, or they don't, we they don't see the value of what is within the continent. And there's a lot there, there's a lot of power there. And I just think that that's something for anybody that is also from a lower middle income country to think about is that it's not only that the West has to be interested or the West has to buy in. I know why it would be good if they did, but if they don't, we still can work within and amongst each other. There is a lot of power, there is a lot of potential, and I know sometimes the resources are not there, but if we come together and come together effectively, not competitively, I think there's a lot that can be done. And it doesn't mean you can't work and collaborate with others, but I think that that was a powerful relationship that I saw, and it was a, one of the best experiences that I, I had in all of my career. So I just wanted to bring that up. Thank you. That was a comment. It's not a question. 
And in fact, I invite you once again to the Afri Health session on Sunday. And Afri Health is about that. So let's have Can a Can I just a, say, say something to you? I would recommend social media and the internet, and you can connect with the globe. Tell your story, get it out there. Now that you've responded to this one, there's a gentleman who asked a question. Let's uh, respond to his question too. In Arizona, where are you, Arizona? work inside USAID, uh, you know, it's hard to say. I mean, one of the reasons that, f that people want to become Global Health Fellows is because they want to figure out how the money flows, how it works. There, are, there has grown up an industry of organizations that uh, do one-day, two-day uh, workshops on uh, the whole business of the federal government. There's also, they're also adding foundations to that in terms of that to gaining that story, but it is complicated. Yeah, um, what I'd like to add to that is that it's often that you mentioned part of the issues, um, funding cycles and election cycles, but it's often forgotten that the country where you wish to carry out the project also has exactly the same cycles. So they also have election cycles and funding cycles, uh, and they don't usually work in tandem with the US. And all that adds to the complexities. And that's why ultimately it's more long-term planning with sort of short hops to get on a long-term strategy that's going to help rather than just seeing uh, the beginning and the end of a particular research question being answered within a funding cycle or an election cycle that is out of sync with the funding cycle and election cycle of your site. And that oftentimes causes issues. i like to, just before, I'm sorry, just the, the, the lady who asked the question about real politics versus global health, I think she actually touched on a real issue uh, as regards uh, the fact that the niceties uh, need to at least be contextualized. We're in a different world now. And I think the simple way to convince uh, governments uh, on both sides of the income divide is that a disease somewhere is a disease everywhere. And I think until we get people to understand that, that quite frankly, if there is antibiotic abuse in one corner of the world, uh, all that patient has to do is to get on a plane and it becomes a problem in DC. So, we do have uh, five minutes to go, or six. In order to take all the questions, let's have half a minute question. Got it. I'm Michelle, I'm from Chicago. I'm a medical student starting my family med residency this summer. Um, you alluded specifically to colonialism in regards to structures, but I was wondering if you or any of the others could comment specifically on how racism and even more specifically white supremacy and anti-blackness play out in these power dynamics that are at play in these partnerships and what sort of lens those in the high income countries can try to put on in order to spot that, call it out and eliminate it as easily as possible. Hi, I'm Antonio Paciencia from East Global and in Barcelona. And I'm afraid my question is going to be a little bit more applied and operational to our Nigerian from the perspective of uh, fairness in research, uh, as you know, there have been attempts in trying to structure a little bit quality of fairness, which is trying to measure uh, a few issues, a few aspects of fairness in research, and trying to use that as ben benchmark, trying to use as uh, a criteria for decision making, and maybe also to influence funders regarding that. So I'd like to hear your thoughts, whether you think this is a useful approach, and what can, in, th in this case, uh, research and medical institutions can do uh, about it. Thank you. Are you specifically talking about the fairness index uh, that is developed by CORED? Well, among others, yes, that, that, that would be one of the approaches. Yeah. 
Hi, my name is Christy Pettichieber. I'm from the University of North Carolina. I'm a master's in public health student. I'm curious about your thoughts on a, a different type of partnership that many universities have, particularly schools of medicine, which is um, mission trips for medical students to take part in going to another country. Particularly, this happens in the United States. I'm, I'm not familiar with other countries, but um, students often feel, I think, a lot of pressure to participate in these trips. And then when they go, while it's an exciting experience, they are often experiencing a level of responsibility and perhaps not the level of support that they necessarily need um, to be doing what they're doing. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on this model and perhaps the, the future of improving this model. So this is Rich Plummer from the University of North Carolina. select our medical students during the first month of entry to medical school. Usually we have about 25, 30 applicants among 115, 117 medical students and we pick up 10 to 12 of them. We advent interview tool based on global health competency just to be certain that we are very selective and appropriately selective in selection of the medical students. And then immediately they go through very structured curriculum for every other week for the entire first year of the medical school. We match them with a mentor immediately from inside and a mentor outside. And then during the first summer, that's the only summer that they have. They have seven weeks of kind of really uh, vacation. Uh, six weeks of that, they go to one of the international sites. They go to the communities. They do some clinical work. And also, we are trying to use sim lab to prepare them in advance because teaching them the, the basically principles of the global health may not be enough. They have to go be through practices in the simulation lab, and then they go, and then they come back, and then during the second year, they have more responsibility, and then when they become senior medical students, they go for the second weeks uh, to the same site that they went when they were first year medical students. I would say anything that you want to shortcut the training of your students is going to cause more harm to your friends and your colleagues outside the United States. You need to, I'm sorry, yep, that's, that's I, I wanted to say something really quickly about the subtext of power differential in these partnerships. And I think we're in a very interesting situation. I think that the Trump presidency is going to have a very big effect, at least in my small world in Washington, D.C., the um, humiliation and the heartbreak is uh, a per it's a very personal journey that massive numbers are experiencing and so it, it there's a humility that I'm expecting uh, as we as we mend our hearts and we learn our lessons and we reposition ourselves in the world in a, in a much more human and empathetic space. So that's my hope. I was just going to say with the, uh, if I got the question of the medical students right being uh, given levels of responsibility, I think it's it works both ways and it's for the schools to choose very carefully. Um, sometimes we also on the other side have to try and rein in the medical students to let them realize that they're medical students as well. Uh, and, and it's really a question of choosing the mentors as has been said. Once uh, they're mentors on both sides, I think things will be just fine. It's universal. Now, a quarter of a minute each. We are running over. Please.
Let's make it very short. Yes, I'm Peter Chibanyu from Uganda originally. <coughs> I'm a global health student at George Washington University. Um, my question is to everyone. Thank you so much for your great presentations. Um, I was listening to a lecture in one of my classes. It's a global diplomacy class. And I listened to Mark Gavo. He's a, a global um, fund director. And he said specifically that um, very soon, uh, partners or organizations that come to, let's say, low income countries uh, with the mentality to patronage or um, they want to run um, 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 let's say programs without the mentality of servanthood or service they will soon run out of jobs um, they will okay. soon be jobless so I wanted to see it, if, if, if any of you agree with his sentiment okay second one Good afternoon, my name is Nema Kaseje. I'm from Kenya, I'm a pediatric surgeon, and it'll be very short. Um, what do you feel is the end point for any partnership? You know, is it the self-sufficiency, independence of, of the team located in, 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 in low and middle income countries? So that's my question, thank you. Thank you, and the last one. My name is Anya Gushin. I'm from Loyola University in Chicago, as well as representing the Himalayan Cataract Project. So an ophthalmologist. And I wanted to pose a question to you um, in the sense that ophthalmology is involved in global health as well. And, and so one of the things that we found as a potential solution in skipping sort of the high income into low uh, or middle income uh, country partnerships, but actually have serve as the liaison between low and middle income Countries. So in other words, we have partners in some of the similar countries that you mentioned, so Nepal, Ethiopia, Ghana. So rather than having um, American ophthalmologists come to those countries and serve as educators and, 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 and train, we actually have, um, we're training the master educators from um, both Nepal, Ethiopia, Ghana, that they're taking the initiative and training amongst themselves and building it as a team. So it's not just the doctor, there's a nurse involved, there's an ophthalmic technician, all the levels of care down to the biomedical technician and, and the people that escort the patients because the blind person comes with a, a guide each time, so the family members. So I'm wondering if there's a way, if there's a role for uh, implementing that level of change where we're, we serve as a liaison between the countries because as, as you mentioned earlier, um, the solutions are already in that country. Um, the, they're, they're adaptive and the resources can come from the outside but, but the exchange can happen on, on the same level. Let me see if the panel can give uh, very, very short answers. I don't think the question uh, was basically uh, about what should be the metrics of the partnership. Uh, obviously, uh, my perspective is basically bringing very talented colleagues from international sites, work with them shoulder by shoulder, and let them be the seeds of the change in medical education. Let them see what we do, what is good for their country, what is bad for their country. Leave them completely alone. Just open a new window to their education and then let's see what they will do. That's basically my answer to the metrics part. On the other end, on this side, obviously I mentioned that just I hope that my medical students are becoming better humans when they come back they can identify vulnerability they know that on the shadow of the sky scratches in Danbury or in New York uh, stays the population of the people that they are really underserved and they are marginalized and we have only one mission and one task basically to fight for the human rights so I think partnerships are not uh, mechanisms, they are organisms that are ever shaping, shifting, ever changing, and they uh, come together uh, for a period of time and then they uh, will evolve into something else. So it, I don't feel, um, I don't feel that you can actually go wrong at all with um, a partnership.
partnership process? Uh, yes, uh, I couldn't agree more with Sharon. Um, I, I think that that's actually the point. There is a true partnership has no end point. Uh, I can say that because, as I said, I trained uh, both in the UK and the US, and going home, I was actually seeking partnerships as a high income person to a low, to a low middle income uh, environment. And the truth of the matter is that if the partnerships are, uh, are entered in, in with all sense of sincerity, you learn from each other and you just continue to go from point, the, the end points just keep changing. The issue is to realize that it's a bi-directional world and there's synergies and then it would never really truly be fair. Uh, and I also want to say that I think the fairness index is okay, but it still is applied by humans. That makes you wonder about its fairness. So ultimately, it's acceptability uh, that's going to make it easy, not really an index. Well, please join me in thanking our panelists for a very good discussion. And thank you for your patience and staying over time.